Welcome in, everybody, to the Thursday edition of Darkness Radio. I'm Tim Dennis. Got a good program coming for you. Got an old friend on the program that we're going to talk to. Uh, I, if you people have not been subscribing to Discovery Plus and going over the paranormal section of Discovery Plus, I don't know what you're waiting for. If you haven't done it by now, uh, you're, you're just absolutely robbing yourself of a, a rich experience of paranormal over there. One of the shows over there that uh, absolutely will change your mindset to investigating and uh, to what is out there as far as the paranormal goes, and, and just a treat in general, is Portals to Hell. It's the show with uh, Jack Osborne and one of my favorite investigators, uh, Katrina Weidman, who has a wide experience of investigating that uh, initially started with Paranormal State long, long time ago. But uh, since then, Katrina has really come into her own and become one of the premier investigators in the field of paranormal investigating. Let's bring her on now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back for another time to the Darkness on the Edge of Town Paranormal Radio Show, Katrina Weidman. Hi, Katrina. Hi, Tim. <laughs> hey there. Uh, hey there, buddy. <laughs> now, we're in season three of uh, of Portals to Hell, and uh, I tell you, I, I've enjoyed the season a lot, and i uh, I, I said this off air, I'll say it on air. You have really, really taken charge on uh, this season of Portals to Hell to the point where I, there's a, if I may say so, and this is not meant in any derogatory term, you've really become one of the premier lead investigators in the field. I, I truly do believe that. And I, I, I want to I throw out, I said this with Bruiser yesterday, I want to throw out the male-female type. Uh, how do I how do I want to put this? The male-female um, labeling of investigators. Throw that out. I believe of both male-female compartments. We throw it out. I put you with either male-female as a lead investigator is one of the best because I it's Thank you. It, it's just you have that command now. You have that. You have the the lead. You have the knowledge. You have the skill set. You have, uh, I believe, the intuition which comes with it. And I think I think in this field, people are afraid to use the word intuition because it, they want to be science based and they want to be skeptical, but they don't want to use the word intuition. And I think intuition is what people want to lack, but they do need it. Am I right there? I, 100%. Um, I think, well, and not just in the paranormal, but I've let intuition lead me uh, pretty much in every area of my life. Um, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for my intuition, you know, because I, you know, so my degrees from college are in music and theater. I have two degrees. And so, you know, I was, I was always just going to go to school you know, after I graduated, I was going to go into the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I had no ambition for college. That was not my thing. I was not a good student. Mm -hmm. um, didn't think I had that ability to be a good student. And um, when I was dropping off a friend to Penn State um, many years ago, like I can tell you the exact moment it happened, we were, we were on campus. They had a conversion van, you know, one of those like cool kind of creepy vans but they were cool to kids that had like tvs in them and all that stuff like back in the day yeah yeah his parents had yeah his parents had one and so we took that up to penn state and i remember opening up the sliding door and i put both of my feet on the pavement at the same time and this insanely overwhelming feeling of like you need to be here came over me it was probably one of the strongest sensations I've ever felt in my life. The only other time I felt something similar was the first time I went to New York, um, like as a young adult. But it, the Penn State one was so, so strong to me. And I remember the next day, like I went home, went to my community college. I'm like, I need to go to Penn State. They weren't very encouraging <laughs> because they're <laughs> like, you don't have SATs. You barely graduated high school. Like, well, what are you doing? Um, <clears throat> but Long story short, went to Penn State, and if people have been following me, they know my story. I got involved with the, with the Paranormal Club up there. We got our own TV show, and it just snowballed ever since then. And, you know, so speaking of intuition, it very much led me 
on a path that I wasn't consciously thinking of at all, like at all. It was a shock to anybody who knew me. My parents were even like, what are you doing? Like, I was like, college? <laughs> like, are you sure? This is like a huge investment and you've never shown interest in it, like ever. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but, you know, I use that very much so in my work because there is no instrument that can tell you a ghost exists. Like, we're not there. So what I have found is you have to pay attention to what your body is telling you. You have to pay attention to this quote unquote feelings, even though we feel really silly sometimes talking about it. But I have found that when you pay attention to that and you let your body lead you to where you need to be, that's the time you start capturing objective evidence. So something subjective leads you to something objective. And when we think about it, take ourselves out of it. When we're interviewing clients, the first thing they'll tell me is how they felt, Mm -hmm. you know? So if I'm talking to a homeowner, they'll be like, I was doing dishes and I just felt weird. I don't know how to describe it. I felt like somebody was behind me. You know, they'll go into things like that or somebody will be like, I felt anxious and I had no idea why. And then this happened. So we know that the body is a good detector um, or a good, the feelings are a good precursor to activity happening. Okay. You know, I I want to follow up on the point that I made earlier in the program and you kind of cemented it with what you just said there. Now, don't take this as me pumping sunshine up your skirt or anything. And I'm not saying skirt (laughs) in a sexist way. Um, I'm just trying to be somewhat correct here. Um, But uh, the way you put that and the way you you just said that reminds me of something that a mentor of yours would have said. And a lot of the way you've attacked things in this season of Portals to Hell reminds me a lot of Lorraine Warren. And I... Oh, gosh. And I think, honestly... Honestly, Katrina, when I watch you investigate this year, I, a lot of it re- reminded me of Lorraine. Um, mm. A lot of what you did this year reminded me of Lorraine. And I think that's and it, because I'm seeing more of the intuition uh, come out of you when, mm. when you're investigating. And where it really comes out, and, and it, we're going to talk about this in the second half of the program, is the new YouTube series that you have out called Travel the Dead. Um, mm. And I'm seeing a lot more of it there, I guess, appearing there. I know that there is a, a format and a way that you do things on, on Portals to Hell. But it really does come out um, in Travel the Dead. And again, we'll address that later in the program. T- tell me a little bit, if you will, how the things that you learned from Lorraine come out in you when when you are investigating, especially on, on Portals to Hell. What is it that you find kind of like, you know, when 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 we as adults hear little things from our parents or little things from our parents kind of come out in the way that we do things, how is it that things that you learn from Lorraine come out when you're investigating? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you. That's, that's a really nice compliment and uh, mighty big shoes to fill. <laughs> I don't know that I'll be able to fill, but um, she, so I think the thing that about Lorraine that, you probably don't know about unless you're you really studied her career is that I I think her most special gift was connecting with people. She had a really magical way of just being someone's friend when, you know, you got to understand like when people are going through a haunting, they feel like they have lost their minds Mm-hmm. they're ostracized from their communities. They don't want to tell their friends or family. Um, it's a very isolating experience. And, you know, some of the families I've worked with, I think they were probably at the lowest points that they've been, been in their whole lives from going through stuff like this. And when we would watch Lorraine work, it was just like, she was like an angel coming to this, to these people. They just found the solace that they so desperately needed in her. And, and it's not like she would like go in deep into, Hey, what's your psyche like right now? Like, you know, she wasn't like, you know, giving them an MMPI or anything. Like she was just there and she would just listen. And I think it, there's a couple of things that I really admired about Lorraine besides that she was gun ho for everything 
there was a time in college. Now, keep in mind, we are college kids. We are like 20, 21. We could stay up all night with the best of them. I mean, we were Penn Staters, number two party school, right? Yep. (laughs) That woman beat all of us when it came to like energy and just, you know, come on, we're going to do this. Like there was, there was one case we went on and it's like two in the morning and we're exhausted. We just wanted to go to bed and she's in her full get up skirt, you know, dressed to the nines like she always was. And she wanted to go trek through the woods. And she was like calling us all like a bunch of children because <laughs> she, because we didn't want to do that at two in the morning. Um, so she was she was very classy, but very fiery, too, in her own way, you know. Um, and so I admired her bravery. I, I admired that she um, she knew what people thought about her, that she knew that there were people out there that, you know, thought what they did was weird and all that stuff, but she didn't care because her mission was to help people. And, um, you know, so I think I, I look at all of that and I take, or I try to hold on to those lessons that I learned from her. Now I'm going to tell you where I saw a little bit of Lorraine in you. Um, and this is a point where you got me in this, in, in watching these episodes um, where I thought maybe you guys were making a mistake with somebody uh, in the series where, where maybe I thought you were getting got, and it turns out that you got me. Um, it was at, uh, I believe it was Eloise psychiatric hospital. And uh, it was, it was, you remember in the, in the doctor's bathroom where, mm-hmm. um, where people were feeling like they were being choked. Okay. Yeah. And was it Lisa who was the one who was uh, more of an empath where she could feel like she was having a bad time in, the, in that bathroom? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to me, as I'm sitting there and I'm watching, and mind you, I don't know much about this woman at all. But the way that the episode is shot, you get the idea that she puts, uh, the, the best way I can put it is that she, she assigns a lot of human characteristics to spirits that she's got more, like she assigns human characteristics to the building, that she takes ownership of, of what the building is and what the spirits are there, right? So I get this, I get this impression. That's how I, I get that, that maybe she's a little more attached to the building than maybe what you guys are seeing. So I'm thinking, oh boy, right? I'm thinking maybe she's taking you for a little bit of a ride, okay? And it's in this moment that I'm thinking this, that you're the one who reaches out to her and says to her at one point, I believe you used the line, something to the effect of what is it that we can do for you to help you feel better? Right. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, cat, don't do that. Don't do that. Right. <laughs> cause, cause that's the, mm-hmm. that's casting the line that basically is just, you know, asking to get reeled in. Right. Yeah. And she tells you, you know, she, she basically tells you what it is she needs, you know? And I'm like, oh, God, oof, no, 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 right? You just, you just mm-hmm. laid it out there. Well, in your brilliance, and I'll, I'll give it to you, you, you saw exactly what it was she needed. And in that moment, and in, in exactly what Lorraine would do, you believed her. You believed mm-hmm. that she was being tormented. Not that maybe mm-hmm. she took ownership of the building or that she was seeing something that wasn't there, but that her torment was real. Yeah. And so you walked it backwards and looked for evidence that there was something there that was tormenting her. And you were seeing that there was indeed other people that were tormented when they were in there. And indeed there were spirits there that were doing the things that were, were being reported there. And indeed it wasn't just her taking an ownership of the building and seeing things that maybe weren't there, but you could prove that she was sensitive and she was feeling those things. And in the end, here I am sitting there with egg all over my face going, okay, she wasn't just, you know, a little, a little uh, imaginative in the deal. She really was feeling these things and seeing these things and she wasn't overreacting. And here I am looking stupid. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, it, so my apologies to her. Um, and, and there it is. And there's that style that, that Lorraine definitely had that you definitely uh, 
definitely not only learn from, but I think are using, you know, in the, in the field. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It was, and, and that's the thing, like, you know, we had uh Cindy's reading, she came in later that night and she pretty much described everything that Lisa had been talking about. And, um, you know, so there, there was a lot of things I think that, that got us to that point, but, you know, at the end of the day, and it's something Heather and I talk about a lot, uh, Heather Taddy, mm-hmm. because we both started with the Paranormal Research Society. We both started on Paranormal State and with Lorraine Warren. And we talk about the fact that it gave us such a good foundation for the work. Mm-hmm. It gave us a, a huge respect for the work and for the people you come into contact with. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, ghost hunting can be fun and it can be a fun night out. But um, there's also the other side to it, especially if you're working with people and it's not just the location um, that, you know, we always said this on paranormal state, but it doesn't matter if what they're experiencing isn't real because it's real to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where we always felt our work came in, you know? And so to me, I think my whole career hasn't really been to, prove or disprove it's been to help those affected kind of, you know, be their advocate um, to document what we can and then to try to figure out, you know, is there an explanation for those things or not? Um, I think those are really the true, that's kind of the true job of, a, of an investigator. I don't, I don't know that our job is to prove or disprove. I like that you yeah. said that. I like that you said that. I, and I like that in the show, you and Jack are, are asking the question, what, what can we do to help you now? What can we do to help you right now? Um, because you, you don't see that question in a lot of shows. There are very few shows. I should put it that way. There, it's not that it isn't there. Um, but there are very few shows that show up and say, what can we do to help you right now? What can we do to help mm-hmm. alleviate whatever tension, stress issue it is you have right now. What can we do to make it better? Um, and it, it seems like that's, that's not put on the table, nor is it resolved by the end of the episode. Um, because we know for a fact, these ghosts aren't going anywhere. I, at least I don't mm. believe that they are. Um, yeah. I don't believe that Jack and Katrina are going to walk into uh, Eloise psychiatric hospital. And after <laughs> years and years of these, these spirits being there that, that you guys are going to get rid of them. I don't think that's going right, to happen. Yeah. Um, no, and we never say that either. Like we are never like, we're going to get rid of your ghost. That's not, that's not what we do. You right, know? Right. And, and, and I don't expect you to go in there and, and approve or disprove of them either. I, and, and I don't expect there to be any magical solution to it either. Um, but if we see something really cool, that's cool. Um, if we see how it affects the people, that's interesting. And if you're telling an interesting story, that's interesting too. That's what I expect out of a lot of these different paranormal shows to, to get an interesting story. Um, if we see something that's to me, that's kind of the cherry on the cake, isn't it? Um, Mm -hmm. and then on top of it, if we do get some sort of a resolution for the person that's there, I think that's even better. Um, and then if, if we can see that, that's even better. It's not always possible, obviously, in all the time that we've been, we've been doing this. Um, I don't think that's entirely possible, especially on television. It's hard to follow up on that sort of stuff. Um, but I I have another question here too, uh, Katrina, because it's, it's interesting to me and having, having followed you for, for all these different years, I have to know for myself, how is it, how is it that you feel that being paired up with, with Jack has changed you as an investigator? Um, well, I think every person I've worked with, I've, I've taken something from them. They've made me a, a better investigator in some way, you know, cause you just, I, I like to learn from everybody I work with, you know, and what I like about Jack's style is he's very no, like no BS, like Jack's a straight shooter, mm-hmm. you know? So he's, says what he means <laughs> and he if he wants to investigate a space he investigate he goes there investigates a space and he comes back and i'll tell you what happened to him and so i like his no bs approach a lot and i think um 
not that I was BSing before by any means, but right. just he's very he's very focused on you know what he's doing at the time, and I I appreciate that about him. And he's very um, he doesn't like fluff what he's thinking, you know. He just says yeah. what he means. So I, I yeah. So I I think. I think I've appreciated that the most about him and he's just very easy to work with, you know? Yeah. So I think it's made for, um, really interesting investigations. Cause I I think sometimes if you have tension at work, it can affect the investigation. Mm -hmm. And, um, he's just, he's just a very chill person to be around. So I think that's really helped us on, especially those long nights where you're going all night and, um, you know, he's just, he's always really funny too. <laughs> he will be the first person to break any tension in the room. Yeah. Uh, you know what I appreciate as a viewer, I think of Jack is he doesn't ask anything of the spirits that I don't think they can, they can't do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of times on some investigative programs, it's, you know, knock this over, do this, make this happen, do, you know, jump through a thousand hoops in order to, to please me. A lot of times it's just Jack saying, hey, it's time for us to do a little knocking. I mean, yeah. how tough is that? You know, it's something that yeah. <laughs> no matter how old the ghost is, I think they know what a knock is, you know? We, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless, right? Maybe you, unless you lose some of your, if ghosts are consciousness, unless you lose some of that, Yeah, you know, the longer you're a ghost. I don't know. Yeah. Or just go over and touch that red light. Well, to me, that makes complete sense. Go over and touch that red yeah. light, you know. Um, yeah. To me, it's it, it's, a, it's a very common sense approach and a very, like you put it, no BS type approach to. Yes. Yeah. It's it's very straight shoot. That, that's what you said probably better what I was trying to say. Yeah. It, well, no, you put it eloquently. I just I, I think I'm just kind of backing your point. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's just one of those things where. You know, I think we try to make it so eloquent. We try to make these these spirits do these amazing things so we can say, look what I caught. Um, mm. And it really doesn't have to be that 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 elaborate, you know? It, yeah. It, it, we're really, it, you know, you, I think you have to build, too, on top of that. You know, it, it's, you don't teach your dog how to, how to catch a Frisbee first. Uh, you teach them to roll over and play dead first, and then they catch a Frisbee. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way towards spirits, but you know, I mean, you're just, if you're sitting down to have a conversation with somebody, you don't, uh, you don't sit down and say, so tell me all about your family history. Uh, they kind of look right. at you like, well, who are you again? Um, right. You got to warm up the crowd. You exactly. Know? You have to get them to warm up to you. So, well, how's the weather today? You know, or, or <laughs> how you feeling or, you know, you know, it's uh, th- these are nice drapes you got here on the on the curtains. Uh, yeah. Something just real easy. And, and that's what I like about Jack's approach is it's just real easy. His his contact is real easy at the beginning. And then he moves forward, uh, yeah. which I think we've all I, I mean, I've sat in plenty of rooms and I know you have, too, just even when you're investigating privately or, or on an event where you sit in a room of 10, 15 people and they all look at each other funny thinking, well, what's my first question going to be? Yeah. And, and yeah. it's like the first question's the hardest. Yeah. 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 And there's pressure. Everybody feels pressure, you know? So a lot of people don't say anything and yeah, it doesn't have to be that way. Let me ask you this, Katrina, what, if, if for people who are listening here and they're interested in, in investigating or maybe they're investigating now, what do you think, if you had to pick five openers, five openers to, to ask a spirit when you're sitting in a, an enclosed space and you want to make it something different, can you think of five off the top of your head? Just See, that's tough because it depends on the location and what they've experienced, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say you have to take into account people's experiences, the history, who they think is there, what they think is there, uh, what type of what time of day does do things happen? Uh, are there any triggers that seem to get a co- kind of call and response to occur? Um, that's where you have to, you really have to be the investigator and look at that kind of stuff. And then you use that, those answers to formulate questions to see if you get a response. 
Okay. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Very fair indeed. Uh, I tell you what, let's uh, let's take our break right here. When we come back, let's talk a little bit more about the season that that is the season that was, and and we have two more episodes left of of this season, of uh, season uh, three of Portals to Hell. By the way, folks, if you aren't watching Portals to Hell, you need to you need to go get Discovery Plus right now. Uh, you can get it uh, with or without commercials. I suggest uh, doing it without commercials because then you can just breeze right through. Um, but it's available right now. You can get the app on uh, most services that you use to get your apps. And uh, by gosh, watch it on your uh, television. I get mine through Apple TV. That's why I use uh, what I use. You can get it on Roku as well. Uh, hook it up to your TV and watch it or get it on your phone, whatever you use for, you use for a device. I also watch it on my tablet as well. Um, but make sure you get it and watch this season of Portals to Hell and the two other seasons that are there as well with... Uh, Jack Osborne and our guest Katrina Weidman. When we come back, we'll talk about this season of Portals to Hell and the different uh, the different uh, locations that uh, Katrina has been to, and uh, ask her for one uh, what her favorites were and and what were the tougher locations to get through. We'll do that when we come back right here on the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm Tim Dennis. Our guest is one half of the team of Portals to Hell. This is uh, Katrina Weidman, co-investigator of uh, Portals to Hell. Uh, Katrina, before the break, I teased we talk a little bit about the different locations that you've been to here in Season 3. And we talked a little bit about uh, Eloise Psychiatric Hospital. Um, let me ask you just right off the bat, do you have a favorite from this season that you've been to that... Uh, whether it warms your heart or was challenging to the point where you enjoyed it? I have many favorites from this season. We had such a passionate team that really went out of their way to find cool different locations, some of them that have never been on television before. Um, so a couple of my favorites, I love the Malco Theater. It wasn't the most active place I've ever been, mm -hmm. but... I just, well, I mean, I'm a th theater nerd, so I love theaters anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but the magician who owns it, Max Blade, he's just so creative. And he made the bar, um, the bar area look like something out of a Tim Burton movie. You know, so it's just like this really cool art deco theater. And um, Hot Springs was an amazing town, really interesting history. Savannah Theater was one of our favorites because it's, hello, Savannah. Like, how can that not be one of your favorites? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, uh, Ernestine and Hazel's was another one of mine. That is a, um, it's a restaurant in Memphis. And again, amazing city. And we had really cool experiences there. Um, nothing, you know, off the wall crazy, but just with our ghost box, we had some really unique things that were coming through. And there seemed to be a connection with birds uh, that was weird that kept coming up in witness interviews in our psychic walkthrough with Patty Negri and um, in our ghost box session. Like we just kept having this occurrence with birds. Um, the one coming up this Saturday, um, Pamplin Park in Virginia, one of my favorites. It might be my favorite favorite of the season because it's a it's a historical park and they don't. Oh, like they've had ghost investigations there never for television and they normally don't let this kind of stuff happen just because they are booked year round for tours, you know? So it's not something you can just, it's not very easy to get into, but because of the pandemic and regulations, they were shut down. So they were able to accommodate us. And I mean, it's a huge park, so much history. Jack and I are both history nerds. So you know, we love that part of it, but then it got really weird. Um, we, and I am not the biggest, you know, REM pods always work. Like I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not that person yeah. because there's so many things that can trigger a REM pod. Right. You know, it is, it is no proof that there is a ghost with that being said, have I had 
really unique experiences with them? I have. Um, and Pamplin Park was one of them because we, it was the strangest thing. We would have a flashlight go off and then the REM pod would trigger and they were like across the room from each other, not close to each other. And it would happen whenever we asked questions. Hmm. So it would happen like right on cue and it kept doing it and then it would reverse it. So the REM pod would go off and then the flashlight would go off. Interesting. And it was like all night. It was the weirdest thing. We kept looking for answers. Is there something triggering the REM pod? But we placed two REM pods together to, to rule that out as well. You know, um, the other one never went off. There's only the one. Um, we checked that for faultiness, couldn't find anything wrong with it. Um, we checked the flashlight, couldn't find anything wrong with that. Uh, there was alarms in that building that were going off and they told us it only happens during like ghost investigations. They're like, yeah, this only happens when you, when you people come and we're like, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> um, so, and there were a couple other things that happened, um, that were very strange, but I will save them for the episode, which sure. comes out this weekend. Um, but really cool place. Very cool. And you know, there's something too about civil war battlefields that, that have the energy behind them. I, I guess I'm curious, I, is it with you? Do you find it's every Civil War battlefield or have you have you come up empty on some of them? Um, I think I think any place there's a battle kind of has the vibe, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it's a it's a weird heaviness that kind of hangs over that type of land. But, you know, we definitely did not come away empty handed from Pamplin. I'll tell you that one. Well, that's good to know. And, and looking forward to the episode. I, I, like I said, you, you have two coming up. You have one coming up. Uh, is it July 2nd? Is that the, I have it here in front of me. Let me see here. Uh, um, I believe it is July 2nd. Yes. Uh, the Enchanted Church is your season finale. Yes, that's our season finale. What's cool about that one is it's a very personal connection to Jack. Oh. So, um, yeah, so these are actually people he knows that called us in. Oh, and wow. uh, they, yeah, they have a lot of interesting things in their house. So <laughs> I don't think you guys are going to want to miss that one either. Yeah, most definitely. So, yeah, there a couple of great episodes coming up at the end of the season here. Um, is, there, is there one episode in particular this year that, that you thought to yourself, maybe this wasn't exactly what I was hoping for, or maybe it was... Uh, a little bit of a letdown for you? Hmm. I don't, I don't know if I would put any of them in those terms because I learned a really long time ago not to go in with expectations. Okay. And so be, be, for this reason is that we went in one time thinking that a case was just honestly BS. We're like, there's nothing there. They're just hyping this up and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it ended up, ended up being like super haunted. So <laughs> we were like, Oh, all right. So I, and that was like year one in my career, you know? So I learned back then just never, ever, ever put expectations. And it's funny because like, why would you, it's not, you know, we're working with things that aren't proven yet. Right. So right. we can't really put a stamp of this is how, like exactly how it's going to go. You know, that I don't really know that that's, that's smart on our part to do that. So I just let them be what they're going to be, you know, whatever yeah. it is, it's going to be. And I just try to enjoy the experience and, you know, it's kind of a great life lesson in general. It just, you just got to let things be what they're going to be. Cause it seems like you guys had a, a, a decent time at Fort Mifflin. I, for me personally, I, I didn't have the best time at Fort Mifflin. It was kind of dead for me. Mm. Yeah. I think Fort Miffy is, um, well, I'm, I'm talking about it like I've known it forever. Like Fort, me and Fort Missy go way back. <laughs> <laughs> We're old friends. I'm a silly girl. So, yeah. yeah so, so that's why. But um, yeah, I think Fort Mifflin has been, uh, well, let's see, but I don't even want to say that because I think every place can be hit or miss. Yeah. True. You know, um, there's some really iconic places I've gone to where it's not like we didn't have anything happen, but did I have, the experience that everybody talks about? No, I didn't. You know, so, but does my one experience mean that that speaks for 
the whole place. It doesn't, you know, so it's, it's one of those things. I don't know. You just got to take them as they come. I think in, in our, in our line of work. True. Yeah. It, and you're right. There's, there's, uh, there's going to be off days. I just, throughout this entire event that we went to at, at Fort Mifflin, it just didn't, it, it felt off to me the, the entire, the mm-hmm. entire deal felt off to me. So I, I guess to me, I, I, I thought, well, I didn't want to, I didn't uh, keep in mind. I didn't want to judge it on one, one outing there. Um, but yeah. I have, I have people who rave about Fort Mifflin to me. They're like, Oh, Fort Mifflin's the best. And you just got to give it another try, Tim. You got to get out there. You got to give it another try. And I, it's not a, it's not a location. I'm, I'm, if I had my, my druthers, cause I want to get out to other locations and see other places and, and investigate other places. Um, a return trip to Fort Mifflin or going somewhere new. I'd probably want to go somewhere new before I return to Fort Mifflin, I guess. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think I, so I've been there a few times. I'm good friends with the people that run it. And, um, I, I do wonder if it's one of those places where, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's just one of those places, right time, right place. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I think everybody that I've had that I've spoken to that have had really incredible experiences there, mm-hmm. they just so happen to be in the space at the right time, uh-huh. you know, um, so maybe that's that's part of it. But I'll tell you, we brought out uh, Chris Fleming for our psychic on that one. Mm-hmm. And by golly, I will tell you, he nailed like every single place we took him to. It was, I mean, detailed, detailed reading that he did. Um, it was it was really incredible. So I, I was taken aback, I think, the most by Chris's reading. Chris can be a little scary at times psychically, I'll tell you. I I've never shared this on the air before, but should I tell you a little story about my foot? Yeah. Okay, so we were in Philly, this is years ago, and and in fact I think this is one of the times you stopped by to say hey when we were doing an event in uh in Philadelphia. Um I, Oh, you guys were at Eastern State. Yeah, we were doing Eastern State. Yeah. And I woke up one morning and and uh it was kind of, it was a little early and I was, I was going to go to the elevator and he met me at the elevator and he was angry and he grabbed me by the shirt and slams me up against the elevator. I mean, he's mad, right? And he's like, God damn you. And I'm like, what, what, what did I do? Cause I, I, you know, he and I hadn't seen each other barely through the entire trip. I'm like, what, what's yeah. the matter? He's like, you, I lost a bunch of effing sleep over you last night i'm like what happened what happened what happened and he's like i had this dream i had this really bad dream and i was like and keep in mind now this is when i had two healthy feet okay Mm. and i'm walking around no no issues no problems no nothing and he said i had this really bad dream that that you you were in a hospital and and something was wrong with your foot and 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 uh, it was your right foot and, and they, they had it like wrapped up and, and it looked like it was a, like almost like in a cast type deal. It wasn't a cast, but a cast like type deal. And the, the doctor was pointing underneath your knee and he said, you know, if if, if your if your leg doesn't get better, they were going to take your, your leg right underneath your knee oh. right here. Oh, my God. I kid you not, Katrina. And I wow. said, Chris, my leg is fine. I'm fine, dude. I said, it was just a dream. He goes, well, you need to watch yourself because something's going to happen. I, I just feel it. It was real. It was really real. He said, something's going to happen with that leg. And sure as you know what, <laughs> um, it was only. How, how far did that? Yeah. How far did that predate it? Uh, it was probably, let me think here. That was probably four to six years later that. I was wow. diagnosed with Charcot foot. Wow. Yeah. And it happened. And here's what happened. I had gone into, well, it, in if I rewind a little bit, I had had an infection in that leg and he had actually described, um, cause my foot was wrapped the way he described it. And the doctor did come in at three o'clock in the morning and he drew a line below my knee, kind of like Chris was describing and he said uh, the head of infectious diseases was called, which they hardly call a doctor at three o'clock in the morning. 
Um, mm. But they said he's going to come in and take a look at it at 6 a.m. And if the swell, if the redness and swelling hadn't come down, because I was on IV antibiotics, if the redness and swelling hadn't come down below that line, they were going to take my leg right below the knee. And it was, oh my God. it was exactly how he described it. And I remember, Holy cow. I remembered laying there at three o'clock in the morning thinking, I can't call anybody. It was just me in the hospital. I didn't want to wake anybody up. And I was I like, would have called Chris Fleming. I would have like, <laughs> <laughs> called him, woke him up and said, God damn you. You're the one who told me that this is going to happen. Um, but it was just a freak fluke. I had had a crack in between my toes and I think I had gone barefoot at a beach or something like that. And I'd gotten an infection in the foot and that had caused the infection in the foot. That's what caused this, the swelling in the infection in the foot that time. But the permanent Charcot foot that he was worried about actually happened about four to six years later. The, the permanent wow. issue with the foot. So he called it right down the middle. He saw, he saw a danger where I could potentially lose my leg. And that's what he was so worried about. But it did eventually happen. I haven't lost, wow. I haven't lost the leg. That's what he was worried about. But he just saw a condition where I could p- potentially lose my leg. It's so bizarre. Yeah. So... Yeah. And, and, uh, so yeah, he, he was constantly on me for, for years and, but didn't understand what the condition was. Mm. Yeah. Wow. What was his reaction when you told him? He didn't talk too much to me after that. I think it was because, I don't know if it was because he sees something else that he doesn't want to tell me or what. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I, there was a psychic I used to go to when I was in high school. She was down at the beach, but I'll tell you, she was one of the best psychics ever. Like she, I was 16 at the time and uh, my friend had introduced us to her because she predicted something in his life that happened like a year later. He's like, we got to go, we got to go. And at the time there were three guys that were trying to date me that I was kind of interested in. Mm-hmm. And, um, but something was holding me back. I don't know. And I, I knew back then, you know, you don't give them information. Don't tell them anything. Like I, I would switch jackets with my friend, you know, so we didn't like look like us, you know, I did all those things Yep. and only yes, no, or maybe. And at the very end of my reading with her, I was getting up. I'm like, okay, thank you. And she's like, Oh, you need to stay away from this person, this person, this person. And she named all three of them. no, Yes. Named all three of them. And I stayed away from all three of them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But um, it's crazy. I, I, there's definitely something to it. There is. You know, it's, it's, um, it's crazy because, you know, I'll bring it back around to investigating. We, you know, one of the, um, one of the psychics who really impressed me this year on, on your show and um, actually on both your shows. And uh, you you bring it around to investigating, and you get such accurate information. But then you you think about, well, should I use them in my personal life? Because you're afraid to know what you know what accurate information could come up there. Michelle Bellinger is 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 yeah. so incredibly accurate when it comes yeah. to a lot of that stuff. And do you ever? Now, let me ask you this: Do you ever do you ever consult Michelle in your personal life? I have once or twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. During, um, there were some situations going on both times that I was having trouble kind of seeing, I don't know which way was up, you mm-hmm. know? And again, you know, I've worked with Michelle a very long time. I don't tell her anything. Um, I think I approached her I think the, the last time was like four years ago. And I approached her and I was just like, hey, you know, would you mind giving me a reading? She's like, sure. And she nailed it. Um, it wasn't about anyone she knew or uh, would have known. And she just nailed the situation to a T, personalities that were involved to a T. Um, and it was, I mean, very, very accurate. But, I, you know, I don't I do not do that a whole lot right, yeah. to psychics. I know it's... Um, 
I go to people I don't know for the most part, yeah. but if, like, I, if I feel like I want to do something like that, but every now and again, yeah. And you know, Chip will, um, Chip is funny. He'll just be like, I'm getting something from you. <laughs> like, you're like, what are you getting Chip? And he'll just tell you. So, you know, sometimes your friends who are psychics, they'll just, if they feel something, they'll just tell you. Um, others uh, that I've spoken to, they're like, I, I've kind of learned, don't say anything unless somebody wants a reading. Um, so, uh, but yeah, no, Michelle is, uh, she's a, there is something going on with that fabulous brain of hers because yeah. she is so accurate and we were, uh, you know, I've worked with her since paranormal state. She's worked on paranormal lockdown on portals. And one of my favorite moments with portals, and I don't, I cannot remember if they kept it in the episode or not. I haven't seen the episode in a long time. And so I remember the investigations, how they happen in real life. And like, as everybody knows, a lot of things get left out yeah. from, you know, what people see at home. But, you know, she prefers to work blindfolded because she doesn't want visual cues. It, yeah. it holds her back too much. Yeah. And, you know, which is incredible. And she's actually much more accurate when she wears the blindfold. Um, and Jack is, you know, he's, oh my gosh, he's a, he's a dad of three girls. And so he's so patient. Mm -hmm. And so he leads her because I would have her running into walls and I, she probably, <laughs> she probably would have fallen down the steps at this point. Oh, if no. I had to lead her like Jack is just <laughs> really good and calm and patient about like leading her around all the buildings. So he always leads her. And, um, she, we were at the old Paulding jail and she puts her hand on his shoulder and he was wearing some like flannel shirt. Which, you know, okay, maybe she could feel it was a flannel shirt. Maybe, I don't know. But a solid color shirt also can be flannel. Yeah. And this flannel had like four or five different colors in it. Again, she's blindfolded and she double blindfolds. So she can't see out the bottom. Mm -hmm. And she puts her hand on his shoulder and she's like, oh, your shirt is this color, that color, this color, that color, and that color. She's like, I don't know why that's important for me to know, but I just saw it. And she was spot on. Wow. You know, and she did that at Trans Allegheny too. I think I think they kept this in the episode where she walks in and she starts describing the paint color on the wall and she's blindfolded. And even, you know, a skeptic could be like, well, maybe she saw it is so pitch black when we bring her to these places. Like the only light is from the camera a little bit. There is no way that she would have saw the the like the exact color of paint it was you know she was so specific with her wording yeah um so she says yeah yeah something's going on there i i find that amazing too yeah that she double blindfolds when she comes into a, a location and just insists that that everything just comes to her. And the one thing and and we'll get to it here in a second we'll talk about what what she did with uh, travel the dead that to me is 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 amazing too. I mean, I, I've only seen it done once before and that's with a psychic named Bob Baca out of Iowa who, uh, who's appeared on our show in the early days. And, and, and I thought it was amazing that he did it. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it uh, talking about being deadly accurate in a space. I think that that's amazing. Uh, I, you know, yeah. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? I, I feel like I. Cut oh you off no, there. I was laughing. I, I was laughing because oh. you said deadly accurate, and I thought that was funny. <laughs> oh yes, deadly accurate. Um, yeah, and and Cindy Kesa <laughs> amazed me too in that she, you know, she came into that space uh, with, um, especially with the doctor's uh, bathroom there at uh, Eloise, yeah. and just uh, man, she she really just came in and nailed everything and 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 really solidified that case for you. I thought that was, that was something else. Um, you know what? Yeah. I'm, let's, let's talk a little bit about Michelle and, and the, the series travel of dead. I, I, people who haven't seen it on YouTube really need to check out this, this uh, series that you've started over there on YouTube. Um, I enjoyed it highly and I'll tell you why, uh, first of all, uh, Katrina, and that is, I think we get to see a little bit of a different side to you. I think we get to see, um, a little less TV Katrina. And I think we get to see a little more true Katrina in here, don't we? Yeah. So travel the dead started. Um, so for those who, who haven't seen it, it's an investigative, I, I don't even call it a show. I call it a journey because mm -hmm. that's really what it feels like. Um, and it's been, 
you know, I've worked so long in this field and I don't think it's ever been from my perspective. It's always been from, you know, other people I'm investigating with or from clients or, you know, et cetera. And so, you know, Heather and I, Heather does this with me and we've, I mean, we've been investigating professionally for like 16 years at this point. And so these are things, you know, we get asked all the time, can you come to this place? Can you come investigate our house? Can you do this? Can you do that? So we're always going out and doing this stuff. So Travel the Dead really came about because we're like, why don't we just grab a camera this time, you know, and yeah. like take it with us. Yeah. Um, and it was also the pandemic. So we were like, all these places are shut down. They were like, can you come out anytime you want to come out? Nobody's here. We can't use it. So if you want to come, you can come. We were like, sure. Like, why don't we do it? And um, I really wanted it to be more intimate. I wanted it to be a peek behind the curtain of what it is to be an investigator, you know, because there's, um, it, I don't know that we often get a chance to talk about that. It, it's a really heavy subject matter that we deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. And when you experience activity that isn't supposed to exist in our world, it can really mess with your head. Like this, I don't, I don't really think this job is for the faint of heart. And I, no. I, do, I do don't say that to compare it to, anything like, like a doctor or a veteran or anything like where you're so obviously sacrificing so much of yourself for other people. Um, I don't mean it in the same, in that vein at all, but I mean it in a way of psychologically, it can, it can really do a number on you, especially when it comes to the history. And it, it can also be really isolating as mm -hmm. a job because mm -hmm. you kind of run into the same thing I was talking about with homeowners earlier, earlier, where, um, there's some people in your life that just don't get what you do. And then there's people in your life that don't even believe what you do. Yeah. And then, you know, there is people that they find out what you do and they don't want to be associated with you. And so it can be a really lonely place to live in. And when that's your job, it, you know, that's not always the most fun. <laughs> true. So, um, but I, I did. I wanted it. I wanted people to feel like they were there with us. Like, you know, this isn't just our investigation. This is our investigation. Um, and to, you know, if you can't get out and actually do it, I wanted, I wanted you to have that more personal feel to it. It, it definitely has the personal feel. Uh, the one thing I'm, I guess I was surprised about was, well, not just the fact that you, you get friends together, some of them that we know, some of them we don't know. Um, but in, and it gives it that much more of a personal feel. It gives us that much more of a look into your life. But I, you give us more of an, a look into Katrina as she's going through a haunted place and what you really do feel when you're going through this, um, which yeah. is, is refreshing. I, I mean, not in, a, not in a comfortable sense. There are some moments that are uncomfortable. I think people who know you, appreciate you, um, not in a weird skeevy way, but have an, an affection for you that, that, you know, care about you and the work you do and want you to be safe. All of a sudden they're watching this and going, you know what? I really don't feel comfortable for her right now. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas when we watch you on TV, we think, well, you know what? Trained professional, not concerned for her in the slightest. She could be standing right there in front of Satan. And we think she could kick him in the balls and run away and be all right. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and we have no worries whatsoever, but then when you watch travel of dead, you go, well, wait a minute. You know what? I, I am a little worried for her now because I, I get an idea of her mindset when, when she's in this setting, which is, you know, in a way it's refreshing and in a way it's a little worrisome. You know, I think you've, yeah. you kind of flipped the script a little bit and you held a, a mirror up to yourself and you let everybody else get a look in on on your psyche and a little bit on, on how Katrina operates just personally when you're in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was definitely one of the goals, you know, because one of the questions I get asked a lot, I know Heather gets asked a lot. What is it like when you're in that place? Are you scared? Are you, do you still get scared? Do you, how can you go into that place? You know, um, how can you do what you do? And so it became this thing of, um, 
let's just pull back the curtain and show it. Mm -hmm. There's uh, you go to the White Hill Mansion and it's a place you've been before. So, you know, uh, of course, being the jaded paranormal fan, you'd say, well, she's been there before. What could be the worst that happens? Katrina, what's <laughs> from your perspective, what could be the worst that happens? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess, I don't know. It would be the, the demon coming out of the hole and like, I, I don't know, pushing you down the steps and it, what, whatever we've seen in all those horror films, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. Amityville running out in the middle of the night in the rain with the walls bleeding or whatever's happening. Uh, <laughs> I guess that would be the worst. But in my experience, the worst thing that's ever happened to me was the scratch. Um, that was the scariest. So I guess that would be maybe the most realistic worst thing that could happen. But, you know, I think going back to places over and over again, because, you know, we hear those criticisms, criticisms in, in the field. However, it's really important that we go back for a bunch of reasons. One, you and I already discussed where it could just have an off night. Yeah. You know, I've been to a bunch of locations. Um, uh, there's been a few locations that I've been to multiple times and I can't say that they've been consistent. They've each been really different for me. And so I think that's important. But two, again, we're, we're also working in a field that's not proven yet. So, you have to go back to the same places over and over again. I mean, that's how we, you know, document. Um, so with White Hill, I had an experience when I, there when I was working um, in 2016. And it wasn't the, the scariest experience by any means. It really wasn't. But mm -hmm. it was enough of one. Here's that psychological thing I'm talking about mm -hmm. where I had this experience. There was no explanation for it. And I'm the type of investigator that I'm like, there's got to be an explanation, right? Because we know the majority of things probably have an explanation. But this was one of those times where we looked, we were trying to debunk. There was, we were left empty handed at the end. And it always stuck with me of, you know, you know how it is. Like you, you're having one of those anxiety filled nights and like yeah. you can't get to yeah. bed and you're like, what was that? Um, you know, and White Hill always popped into my head of what was that? Like, I don't know. So it became this thing of, well, let's go back. You know, they, they've asked me a bunch of times to come back. I'm like, this would be a good opportunity. And I called Heather and I didn't tell her anything. Mm -hmm. And we wanted just to try a different, a different way to see what would happen with that. If she didn't know anything at all, we didn't even tell her where she was going. She had no idea. She was even in New Jersey. I hmm. didn't tell her. So I just, you know, I just sort of kidnapped her. <laughs> <laughs> As friends do. That's you know? what, that's what good friends do for good friends. They just kidnap them and take them to haunted places. Yeah. 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 In Jersey. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you get Heather and you also got two other friends, uh, along with you. Who else came along with you? Yeah. So Kat Croft, who is a filmmaker and, um, Kat was funny because again, it's the pandemic. Um, so she was like, well, cause originally it was just going to be me and Heather and Kat was like, I'll, I'll just come and help you guys out and film you guys. And she drove all the way from Texas to, wow. <laughs> to help us with the investigation. Yeah. And, uh, then Michelle Bellanger, and then we had another helper that was there to do like food runs and everything, but they weren't on camera. Okay. Um, yeah. And then we had two of the, um, they're like the president and vice president. I, I think I have their titles, right. Um, Kyle and Don of White Hill mansion that we interviewed while we were there. So I have to ask you this question, uh, Katrina, because it, it, again, and again, it comes from the psychological side of things. So you return to White Hill where you've had a negative experience you bring friends with you. Now, is this a security blanket to help you with uh, some of the fear that may be there? Or is this potentially to, uh, what's a good way of putting this? Or is this a good way to help you absorb something if it does happen again? You know, is this, is this, uh, not not necessarily a security blanket to help buffer what may happen, but a support system in case something does happen. Oh, that's a good question. I have not thought about that. I would I would assume it'd probably be both on some sort of subconscious level. You know, I think 
subconsciously, I was just like, let's just go back and see what happens. But um, I'm sure there was some level, both of those in me, you know, uh, or maybe I'm kind of evil and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> let me put my friend in, <laughs> in the same you know location I was at when something scared me. I don't know. M- maybe that could be true too. There could be that third, that third option, <laughs> which is just, Hey, let's just see if it happens to somebody else to verify that it did happen. Uh, right. Know. Right. Yeah. And that was part of the ex- experiment that we wanted to try with Heather who, you know, Heather's not a psychic. She's not a medium, nothing like that. So it was like, what will she feel when she goes in there? What experiences will she have? Uh, We had Michelle do a remote reading. So every location we went to for Travel the Dead, Michelle was remote for us. And it was really, really incredible, the work she was able to do. Um, One in particular that I thought was really interesting. There was a, there's a volunteer at White Hill Mansion that saw plain as day, a child, blonde hair, chubby cheeks. And he would put him in like the three to five year range. And um, Michelle, again, doesn't know where we are. I I don't tell her anything. Um, She's in Ohio. We're in New Jersey. And when I'm standing in the area where people have seen this little boy she starts talking about a little boy with blonde hair and chubby cheeks, ages three to five. And she did it by FaceTime and she wasn't wearing her glasses and was blind as a bat. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So and now Michelle, in her interpretation, she put him in a different time period than I think a lot of people put uh, like the volunteer. I think he was thinking more old timey than Michelle did, but, I, I don't, you know, that's also interpretation. Right. So with psychics, sometimes they have to break through their own interpretation of things because they can get their interpretation wrong. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I do find it, I mean, wh- what is, the, what are the chances of that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought it was amazing. And, and I, I, the only yeah. parallel I can draw is uh, we had a psychic by the name of Bob Baca, and I've told the story here on the air before, so I won't take up too much time with it, but uh, Dave and I were sitting in the studio. This is in the early days of Darkness Radio, and we're recording out of a production studio at the old KLBB studios, and we had a blue window frame around us, you know, or, or in front of us, blue window frame for the production room that was adjacent to the main studio. And he was telling us that... Um, an old coworker of mine who had passed away just about a year or two per, uh, previous um, was standing to my right and he was in the building and he was watching the two of us do the show. And he said, uh, you know, he said his name was John. And he said, John, I said, how is John standing to the right of us and, and watching the two of us do the show? He said, He says he can tell you he's standing there watching you because you're both sitting side by side next to each other in front of the uh, production board and you're sitting in front of a blue window. Mm. And I went, whoa, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and he told me all that while on the telephone, which I thought was amazing. You know, so it it was. Yeah, I I think ESP is going to be one of the things that gets figured out first in the field. Yeah. Cause I really do think there's something to that. I, you know, I just, I've met one too many people that have had experiences. I've met one too many psychics that I, I really don't know how they do what they do. Um, I've had personal experiences myself with that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, and like, are there frauds and fakes out there? Of course. Sure. Yeah. But there's also the other side where there really is something going on. And so I, I think that'll be, I mean, I don't know if I had to put money on it. I think like aliens and ESP would probably be the first two <laughs> to get some sort of answers. Well, where, where do you sit? Uh, let me ask you this. Where do you sit on, on what's been going on with uh, aliens and, and UAPs and UFOs and, and everything that's been going on in Capitol Hill? Oh, I don't, I haven't followed up with, with, oh, you mean with them disclosing things? Yeah. Yeah. With uh, the, what the soft disclosure is on Capitol Hill or what, what is v- attempted to be going on with it. Uh, really it's kind of a stall job, but how do, how do you sit with it right now? What do you think is, what's, what's your take on it? What's the truth? You yeah. Mean? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, so I'm a believer. I, I actually do believe there is something going on. Um, 
a really great book by, uh, I worked with him like 10 years ago, Richard Dolan. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote a, he co-authored a book called After Disclosure. And he gave me a copy. And um, it's interesting because it goes into all the reasons why we would have to hide the truth. Okay. And it's, it's not, I, I don't know, I guess you kind of grow up thinking like, well, yeah, why don't you just say it? Like, right? What's the big deal? Yeah. Um, but he goes into, you know, you know, religion, government, economy. Um, people might lose their trust in government. And then what happens then? Uh, the world has to kind of exist as one at that point, if it's the world versus the other worlds, you know? And I mean, do we, can we get along enough to be able to do that? Um, So there's just all these factors that come into play. And then they kind of break down some of the more famous cases and why they would be covered up. Um, One of the more interesting points that he brings up, and and I talk about this a lot in the paranormal, uh, well, I mean, aliens are the paranormal, but in the ghost world specifically, is how much we're ridiculed mm-hmm. instead of being taken seriously. Yeah. So the first, when you hear somebody say, hey, I had this experience, or and whether that's aliens or ghosts or the other, everyone's first reaction is to ridicule, ridicule you, um, laugh at you, think you're crazy, whatever it is, instead of what I always think is strange in the ghost world is that, you know, we're talking about hundreds, thousands of people that claim to have these experiences and we don't really give them any legitimacy. We just sort of shrug them off as, well, I don't believe so it can't be true. And it's like, well, I don't know if a hundred people went to the same building over and over again and told me they got a headache standing in the same room. I'd look at that a little close. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. And so it doesn't, I always go back to, you know, it might not be what we think it is. It might not be the afterlife. It might not be supernatural. It could be neurological, psychological, environmental. It could be all those things. Mm -hmm. But I do find it odd that so many people's first response is to, you know, laugh it off and kind of shove it in the doesn't matter box. Um, And I get it. Like we're kind of conditioned to think that way. And there's certain cultures and religions or non-religions that are taught to think that way about this stuff. But they bring it up in this book after disclosure, um, talking about the same way with aliens. And, you know, they'll, one of the references they brought up was with, um, you know, uh, news stories, how journalists will kind of just automatically, they'll present the story as a joke instead of actually taking it in any kind of seriousness. So um, all of this to say, it just, it seems like disclosing that, hey, you know what, there might be some legitimacy to this UFO thing is m- much more complicated than I think, you know, we might have been led to believe it could be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with with uh, the majority of Americans and in, in the, really the majority of the world, I think now believing that there's something that's not quite right out there in the skies, meaning it could be either aliens or unidentified flying objects or UAP. Um, and then it needs to be disclosed. All those files that are sitting there that are uh, other, either they're red acted or they're under lock and key that they need to be released. Um, I, I think now the, the U S government has finally realized they have to acquiesce in some way or another um, and that they can't, pardon my language, they can't keep uh, holding the bullshit meetings they've been holding that they need to come forward and and, uh, slowly start to um, do these soft disclosure uh, phases. Uh, Whether it comes in waves over three to six months, um, we've seen the videos that they've they've released from the armed forces, even though they're not much of anything really other than those Tic Tac videos. Um, I think we'll start to see a little bit more over the next uh, maybe year, two, three years that, that give you a little more meat on the bone. And eventually they'll say, you know what? And, and they already have really said, we don't know what to make of it. You tell us what you think. And they're, they're mm. offering, you know, more of a forum and saying, you come forward and tell us what you've seen. Uh, I think to me, that's as, as uh, forthcoming as they're going to be. I think that, you know, they're, 
for now anyways. And once that people come forward to them and start saying, well, here's my experience, then they'll say, oh, you've had that experience? Well, here, here's another treasure trove of stuff for you to look at. And I think it'll be more of a, you know, more of a give and take. And eventually they're not going to come out with the big enchilada and say, oh, by the way, here's the reptilian aliens we've been talking to for 30 years. (laughs) Um, But, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll let it out in little bits and pieces that, that there's something out there and, and we've had some sort of contact with it, but not to the extent that you, you think they may tell you, but, but I think right, it will come out right. in bits and pieces. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I also think, I mean, they, I mean, right. Like logically, would you, would you drop the whole bomb at once you want it? Right. Because I feel like that's too jarring for a lot of people. I don't think you got to kind of you got to like ease people into the water. You know, you can't just yeah, like jump into yeah. the deep end. Yeah, I, I don't think our society can handle it. I mean, look at the way our society handles things like a shortage of formula. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're just uh, we can't. We're we're fragile people. We we take well, what was the world, the world, right? Everyone when that tele or the it wasn't a teleplay, the radio play. Oh, War of the uh, Worlds aired. Yeah. 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 And, and when, well, that, although that was a different time, yeah, the, the reaction was so intense that, that, yeah, it it just went to show you that we couldn't handle that. Well, it was painted in a different light too. I mean, the aliens came forward as negative and war of the world. Um, and that, that was such a, an extreme news report that of course it was meant to, to elicit a negative reaction. Um, I think even if you painted this in a positive light, um, you would still have, I don't want to say half the country, but you know, you'd still have about a third of the country that would, would say, well, this isn't right. This isn't, you know, an abomination. It's, it's something that can't be true. Uh, either you have to provide us more proof or we're going to go rolling up on it with, with weapons and try to, to destroy it. Cause it's an abomination. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I think you, you know, you, it's something that has to be handled with extreme care as you roll it out and you have to, and I think a lot, that's why a lot of people say that, you know, Hollywood has been trying to condition us for years. I was just going to bring that up. I was going to ask your, your opinion on that. If you think we've been conditioned. I think so. Yeah. That's why you have star yeah. Wars and ETE and, and, and all these sci-fi franchises that have been out there to, make it seem like aliens are just part of your everyday culture um, to, yeah. to make and you know, close encounters and all these other alien films are out there so that you look at the television screen. And when you see something that doesn't look like you, uh, you just go, Oh yeah, it's another alien. Um, Do you think they have their version of earth movies <laughs> like, you know I mean? like, <laughs> to prepare their people for the weirdness that is us? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. I think they have a Godzilla version of Florida man that uh, runs around and stomps on their buildings. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and, and totally they do. Yeah. Uh, it's Florida Zilla. Um, yeah. No, I, Flozilla, there you go. Flozilla, yes. And it probably <laughs> yeah, is yeah. flow from the progressive commercials. Um, <laughs> probably, uh, yeah. No, I I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to think, <laughs> Katrina. I don't know what to think. <laughs> but yeah, they, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think at this point we're, uh, we're just waiting for this tap dance to, to get into high gear and then we can uh, start finding out exactly what everybody knows. But yeah, there's some stuff that's yeah. being held back, I think, on both sides. Yeah. 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 It'll be interesting to see. That's for sure. That's for Ho- sure. Ho- hopefully it's positive. <laughs> that's true. So let me ask you this. With uh, Travel the Dead, is there is there more? And I know you've been you've been releasing in, in little bite sized bits. Are you thinking of doing yeah. a second giant episode or, or, or releasing in more bits and, and turning to a different location? Yeah. So there, there are other locations that we went to. Um, we're working within a few parameters right now that, uh, exist. So, you know, I think, um, for the time being, it will probably be a little bit of slow, slow releases. Um, but that, you know, I think in the near future that would, that might ebb and flow. 
So, but there are more locations and we're just, we're, we're very small team. We're a teeny tiny independent team. So as everybody knows, like, you know, especially with editing and taking on the footage and all that stuff, that is a beast. So, yeah. um, and we have a uh, cat Croft who is amazing at her job and, um, you know, she works very, very hard to make sure that's all in place. But since, since all of us too, you know, all of us who work on it, we're all in the entertainment business. So we also wanted to focus on quality versus quantity. Yeah. Um, so I don't know about you, but I feel like there's, you know, especially with things like YouTube, there's kind of that pressure of, we just need content. We just need content. And, you know, I, I get that. And I, I'm not ragging on anybody who that's their workflow. That's fine for them. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, we really wanted to focus on, you know, let's not put that pressure on the project right now. Let's just focus on the quality of it. Yeah. And, really, you know, really right. make something that feels good to us. Ultimately, things age, and it's it's ultimately has to be quality over quantity because you don't want a, a ton of crap put on the uh, YouTube. You want <laughs> fine quality product put on YouTube because people eventually will go back and rewatch that over and over again. It doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is the the uh, quality of the product that you put out. Yeah, yeah, that's what we think. So we definitely, it's definitely a, a it's. It's been, yeah, slow, slow releases. We're kind of doing the same thing with aliens, aren't we? We're yeah, taking, we're taking that's right. that approach to it. <laughs> that's right. That's what we're doing with Disclosure. We're just taking our time and yeah. putting a few aliens out there at a, at, a, at a time. And if Florida man comes up and blows our head off, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> that's right. Um, Portals to Hell has two episodes left in the season. Um this Saturday is a Pamplin Historical Park. Uh, you can catch that at 9 p.m. Central Time, 10 p.m. Eastern on Travel Channel. Uh, do you have an idea yet on season four? Oh, Timmy, you know I can't say anything. Oh, <laughs> I thought maybe I got an exclusive. No? Nah, lips are sealed. Hmm. <laughs> All right, then. Well, we, we know for sure there's two more episodes here uh, and two good ones at that here uh, coming up both on uh, – uh, June 25th and July 2nd. Uh, well, please give our regards to uh, to Jack and please let him know that we are uh, thinking and praying about uh, Ozzy as well. We know Ozzy just recently had surgery and uh, that we're praying for him as well. And um, Katrina, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's always so nice to talk to you. I, It's been so long, Tim. It has. And we're not going to we're not going to go a long time before this happens again. I know that. I know. I know. Well, I, before I get all like motherly, like, you know how your mom would drop you off at school and like smooch you? Aww. Like, would be like, goodbye, Tim. I, I won't get all mushy with you <laughs> but, uh, because we're buddies, you know, but yeah. thank you so much for having me. <laughs> well, by the way, are you going to be a Michigan Paracon? Uh, I don't believe so. What? I don't believe so. I'm, I know. I've uh, Since the ban pandemic, I took some time off from events. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Oh, all right. Well, so we can't we can't like have a huge rallying cry to get you to Michigan Paracon or anything. I maybe I don't know maybe the the summer still early the summer just started so maybe uh, that's a good one that's one of my favorite events of that the year is, yeah um yeah and didn't you and I weren't we like eating turkey clubs all, like all day from that cafe <laughs> yes there was, was one that, year right yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> It was I a, love the turkey club there. It's so good. It was a turkey club uh, summer, one one summer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Although I, I don't think I've had one since, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> really, these are actually disgusting, but I'll hang out with you anyway. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah. Well, you, you made eating 17 turkey clubs in one day worth it. So I really do appreciate that. I, it's a sandwich I'm probably not eat again until I see you again, but you know, it, uh, yeah, I don't tend to eat them anymore. That's like when you tell somebody you like something one time and then they just think that's your thing. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they always like, they're like, Oh, look what I, I got you. I brought you meatloaf. It's your favorite. You're like, I, thanks. I, I only <laughs> ate it because like, I was sitting with you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that was that was one of those deals. No, I mean turkey clubs are fine. You know, it's a it's a good sandwich yeah. when you're stuck in a casino with no other restaurants. I mean, you know, it's, it's a good yeah. thing. <laughs> you know, but other than that, yeah. 
Yep, yep. But okay, so we won't we won't get the masses startled and start a huge rallying cry to get you to Michigan Paragon if you don't want us to. <laughs> Again, Portals to Hell has two episodes left on Discovery Plus. It's released on uh, Travel Channel on Saturdays, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 Central. Uh, again, uh, the 25th is Pamplin Historical Park, and uh, the season finale is on July 2nd, so make sure you check that out. Uh, Katrina, thank you so much for being with us, and we will do this again very soon. We won't wait uh, a long time to do this again, okay? Sounds good to me. All right, thank you so much. Before we go tonight, I want to do something that we don't normally do on each and every program. It's not because it's something we've cut out of the program, but something that... Uh, we only do, I guess, on a special occasion. I want to ask everybody to join me in doing a prayer and healing request for a good friend of the program. Jan Goldberg is a friend of ours who, unfortunately, has been battling cancer for a long, long time. And right now, Jan is at a crossroads in her care, and she's in palliative care and needs all of our prayers and all of her thoughts, any energy you can send to her. Uh, Jan Goldberg is in the Milwaukee area. If I could tell you for a second about Jan, she's one of a kind. She's um, She's been in paranormal investigating for the longest time, and I met her well over a decade ago. And, and from the minute I met her, she's a spitfire and uh, uh, incredibly funny, uh, incredibly sarcastic, uh, almost to the point of irony. Uh, someone who uh, could make your day in a minute, uh, her her Twitter handle is Jan Rickles, if that gives you any idea. Uh, Jan, three years ago at uh, Chicago Ghost Con, decided she was going to get a, a vendor table and sell uh, mugs and mouse pads with her image on it that just says, Jan is cool. And I've got it right here in front of me. I have hers on my desk right now. And it's an old grade school picture of her with her smile. Her toothy smile just says, Jan is cool. I've got my mug upstairs and I drink coffee out of it every, every other morning. And it reminds me of Jan, <laughs> just her sense of humor. At Chicago Ghost Con, uh, we had IWI Wrestling out there. They were booked into Chicago Ghost Con. So I was not only doing my presentation at Chicago Ghost Con, I was also ring announcing at Chicago Ghost Con as well. That was also the weekend that I got into an accident and got T-boned, so I wasn't feeling the best. Uh, Jan thought it was so cool that there was wrestling at Chicago Ghost Con. The one thing she wanted to do is swing a, a steel chair and hit somebody with it. That, that was one thing she wanted to do, and she wanted a picture of it. So uh, she comes up to me and says, Timmy, I want a picture hitting somebody with a steel chair. And, of course, I was so sore all over my body. I barely got through my, my talk. Um, and I was barely standing <laughs> doing the, the ring announcing. I don't know how I got through that weekend, but I looked at Jen and how happy she was at the fact that she wanted to swing a steel chair and hit somebody with a steel chair that I handed her the steel chair. And I said, who's going to take the picture? <laughs> so I, she said, oh, 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 let me go get somebody. And I think she got, if I remember right, she got her sister Colleen. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember because I was in so much pain. I said, no. She goes, you know, I'm going to wind up and hit you. And I said, I've been in a really bad accident. Please just don't wind up and hit me. And she goes, well, I won't hit you that hard. And she kept laughing at my, my anxiety of her winding up, or at least ribbing me about winding up and blasting me into a different stratosphere with this steel chair. And... Uh, so she's she's winding up like a baseball player with this chair, and I'm getting ready to take it in the back. And she goes, are you ready? Are you ready? I'm going to hit you all the way back to Milwaukee. Are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> and I'm standing there. I'm like, okay. And I said, no, just hit me flat, you know, flat with the chair in the, the seat of the chair in the back. Don't hit me anywhere else. And... Uh, you know, I guess let me have it. And I'm thinking, God, I'm just going to scream when she hits me. It's going to hurt so bad. And she goes, ah! and she barely touches me with it. <laughs> Somebody takes the picture and I act like I'm, you know, I, I got the face on like I'm screaming. She has this face like, 
she she laid it in and the picture looks like a million bucks. I mean, it just looks like a million bucks. I've posted it on social media before because it was such a good picture and it made her so happy. That, that picture, I, I laugh at it. She laughs at it. We have a good laugh over that picture of her hitting me with a steel chair and she got her, she got her amazing wish come true to hit somebody with a steel chair on, uh, on, on a photo. So I'm glad I could make one wish come true for, for Jan and that she hit somebody with a steel chair on, on celluloid. Um, but Jan has that kind of sense of humor and she's, she's always been the kind of person to light up somebody's life and, and, and make them happy, make them smile. Um, she's always been one to be there for people. Uh, she's been the type of person to uh, make an exception and make somebody happy or make their day. And uh, it's at that point where we need to come together and people need to come together to help Jan at this point because she's in that, that space right now where she needs our help. And if you could, please uh, say, a, say a prayer for Jan tonight, whether you say a prayer before bed, whether you say a prayer in passing, whether you've got a spare minute Say a prayer for Jan Goldberg in the Milwaukee area tonight. Whether you're praying for a miracle for her to pull through this, whether you're praying for her to make a peaceful transition to see her creator, um, whether whatever it is that you're praying for, uh, pray for Jan Goldberg, please tonight. If you don't believe in a in in a creator, maybe you uh, maybe you have other ways of going about it. Maybe you're atheist. Whatever it is, send a good vibration to Jan. Uh, put a, a healthy thought in your in your thoughts for Jan today, um, and just send a good thought out for Jan. Uh, keep her in your thoughts. Uh, Jan Goldberg of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Jan, you're on my mind today uh, with a smile, because my friend, you've always uh, been in my mind with a smile. And I'll drink uh, my coffee out of your mug today. And uh, remember that chair shot that never quite made it, <laughs> never quite laid me out. Folks, thank you so much for joining us today on Darkness Radio. Thank you so much for listening all week long. We've had a really good week. I want you to take care of yourself and each other. When you see somebody this weekend, do something for that person that's in need, that needs a little bit of help. The world has turned so dark lately, and we really do need to get back to taking care of each other. If seeing somebody in need by gosh, just giving them an extra hand. Um, it, it costs nothing to, to look out for each other, to, to find out what somebody needs and maybe see if we can help them. Do it for your old boy, Timmy. And when you help somebody in the world that needs something, it comes back right back to you and you receive that help in kind. Just remember that. We'll see you next week, next Tuesday, right here for True Crime Tuesday. And of course, we've got a great week in store for you next week as well with uh, with uh, Darkness Radio as well. Thank you for listening to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is Darkness Radio.